اعوذبلشیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ربی شرح علی صدری و یاسر علی عمری وحل القطن من لسانی یو کہو کولی ٹوڈے وی اسٹارٹ وتھ ورس تھرٹی ون آف سورا القحف دا ورس از دے آر دا ونس فار ہوم دے ول بی دا گارڈنس آف ایڈن Beneath which rivers flow, they will be adorned there in with bracelets of gold. They will wear green garments of fine silk and rich brocade, and they will recline on soft couches. What an excellent reward and what a beautiful residence. So in this verse, the other end of the spectrum is shown. Anything you do for Allah, it will not be wasted. It says in a hadith, the gist of which is that a person who is alone and remembers Allah and then while doing that, his eyes brimmed over. His reward will be that Allah will keep him under his shade on the day of judgment. Just one tear and look at the reward, divine shade on the day of judgment. And just compare it. what we do for people if you do something for people people won't even turn around to uh, thank you even they will repay your kindness with evil and instead of thanking you and appreciating you for what you did for them they will take you for granted they will go to the extent of talking against you even But Allah says that you shed one tear for my sake and I will grant you shed on the day of judgment. Allah describes paradise in detail because we are actually more interested in adorning this dunya rather than a house in paradise. Allah says there would be gardens and flowing water in it. Just the image of it brings peace to your mind. coolness in your eyes then the people of paradise will be adorned with garments of silk and brocade and no toil no fatigue no tension they would be just lying there in couches because they worked hard in dunya so now they can rest verse 32 o prophet give them this parable once there were two men to one of them we had given two gardens of grape vines surrounded with palm trees and put between them land for cultivation now here comes another story the story is that there are two men and one of them is very rich very powerful influential and he has these two gardens these gardens are uh, are of grape vines surrounded by palm trees imagine how beautiful the garden must have been grape vine in the center surrounded by palm trees and they are lush fertile gardens and there is no uh, place that is wasted in the gardens and a river is flowing in between the garden and the production of fruits from these gardens were in abundance so he was by all standards of dunya a lucky man that's what we would think Verse 33, both of those gardens yielded abundant produce and did not fail to yield its best. We had even caused a river to flow between the two gardens. Verse 34, he said to his companion while conversing with him, I am richer than you and my clan is mightier than yours. Now, who is this companion? He is a believer, but a poor believer. Now, this is an important story which teaches us that wealth is something which often intimidates us. So, if you meet someone who is sinning but he is rich, you won't have the courage to tell him that what you are saying is wrong because we are intimidated by his wealth, by his grand house, by his posh cars. So this rich man is boasting to the poor believer, I am richer than you. I am more than you in wealth. I am more than you in wealth 
and I am mightier than you in followers. In other words, I have many friends, many influential friends, and I have more wealth than you. Now, if you think about it, this man is, what this man is doing, he is measuring himself in terms of wealth and friends. And this is what often happens. We look at a man and we measure his essence by the friends he has by the wealth he has. So if someone has a lot of money, we say he's so brilliant, he's such a brilliant person. And if he has many friends, we think he's so popular, he's amazing. We have this tendency to measure people in terms of wealth and status. And this was what Shaitan did. He measured himself on the basis of something which was totally baseless, what did he say? He said, Ana khairun min hum. I am better than you. And this man is also saying, I am better than you. Why? Because I have more money. I have more followers. Verse 35. When having thus wronged his soul, he entered his garden and said, I don't think that their garden will ever perish, nor do I believe that the hour of judgment will ever come. Now he enters his garden and feels at the peak of his power and success. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautifully sums up the reality of his behavior. It says, Wahua zalimun li nafsihi. He was doing zulm to his own nafs. This teaches us that every word of arrogance that we utter is not hurting our companion it's hurting us it's hurting our own nafs it's the worst damage we are doing to our own selves the nafs which is like an unruly horse this man is letting he is allowing the unruly horse to gain control over him verse 36 even if i am returned to my rub i will surely find even a better place than this here he makes the very first mistake of all, the very first delusion of wealth that it is going to last forever. So delusion number one, this person has got three delusions. Delusion number one, that it is going to last forever, meaning his wealth. Number two, that the day of judgment will never come. Life here is so beautiful, so luxurious that it will go on and on. And delusion number three, the worst delusion of all, when we think and believe that just because Allah has blessed us with wealth and comfort in this world, this guarantees Allah's approval. We must have done something good. We, you know, we earned it. We deserved it. This status, this wealth is a stamp of Allah's approval and it automatically follows that because I am rich here, because I am successful here, so I will be successful there too. And this is a delusion which many people are prone to. So much so that when we look at someone rich, we think that he must have done something right. That's why he's so successful. This is how we measure success because these are the gods of today. Status, wealth, technological knowledge <clears throat> sorry I am pronouncing it a bit differently <laughs> technological knowledge verse 37 his companion replied while still <clears throat> conversing with him do you disbelieve in him who created you from dust from a drop of semen and fashioned you into a perfect man now what does the poor believer say to all his boastful statements does he say that yes what you are saying is absolutely right you are so rich so allah must um, you know really love you allah is pleased with you no the poor believer is someone who has seen through this deception. He knows that wealth, status is all a bubble. It's meaningless. So he says, have you denied the being who created you from a dust and then from a drop? Then he fashioned you as a man. And this is dava at its best. He is not intimidated 
at the same time he does dawa with immense wisdom he reminds the rich man of his origin are you denying that allah created you from dust now this refers to the fact that either uh, our nourishment is from the earth or that our origin was from earth because adam alayhi salam was created from dust now he reduces this man from a boastful arrogant man to what just dust where is the room for arrogance when we are from adam alayhi salam and adam alayhi salam was made from dust no matter how glamorous how gorgeous we are in this world we all came from dust and ultimately we all will return to dust verse 38 as for myself allah is the one who is my rab and i do not associate anyone with him here comes a beautiful piece of dawa look at the words this moment uses words calculated to make this rich man realize that what he was doing was shirk now what was his shirk that he was associating his wealth with allah and he let his wealth delude him to denying the judgment and the other shirk that he was doing was that he believed that it was based on his own efforts the moment says alhamdulillah all praise is for allah not my doing not my blood and sweat no mention of i all praise is due to allah so this is what this moment does that i'm not going to do shirk with my rab why does he say this to make the rich man realize what he has done like when we want to stop someone from doing anything what do we say that you know i would never do it we don't say don't do it but it's a, another way of conveying that you know i would never do it if i were in your place verse 39 when you entered your garden why did you not say it is as allah pleased no one has power except allah though you see me in though you see me poorer than yourself in wealth and children now the most interesting thing about surah al-kahf is that it explains the importance of two phrases or two praises which are the mark of a moment's speech in sha allah and ma sha allah words that we often utter without contemplating without thinking ma sha allah a phrase of power a phrase of glory a phrase of majesty a phrase of reality ma sha allah when you entered your garden when you saw your wealth why didn't you say as allah wills this came from allah and this can be taken away by allah la quwwata illa billah there is no strength except with allah just try saying these words with belief and you will feel the strength flowing into you once we realize that we are nothing and allah is everything only then can we understand iman whenever we come home and see our beautiful homes whenever we see our children sitting with us whenever we see our spouses taking care of us our family our friends our deeds that got accomplished why don't we say ma sha allah la haula wa la quwwata illa billah verse 40 yet my rab may give me a garden better than yours and may send down thunderbolts from sky upon your garden turning it into a barren wasteland verse 41 or it is water or its water may dry out and you may never be able to find now the poor believer explains calmly and steadfastly that by worldly standards you are more important by worldly standards <clears throat> you are the winner and i am the loser but we know how temporary power is allahumma malikul mulki tutil mulk man tasha allah king of the kingdom you can give power to whom you will and you can take it away from whom you will and in that dua we read to izzu man tasha 
watuzillu man tasha you can exalt whom you will and you can humiliate whom you will bi yadik al khair all good is in your hands inna ka ala kulli shay'in qadir you are able to do all things so the poor believer says to the rich man that by worldly standards i might seem the loser but i know that maybe allah will give me better than your gardens now he is not cursing the rich man and saying that i hope this happens to your garden or he is not jealous he is simply pointing out to him the uncertainty of life and you would have noticed that how arrogant people become when they have wealth when they have power when they have children especially sons and they have it all and they think nothing is wrong with us they are not doing anything wrong everything that they are doing is right and that gives them the right to hurt other people to say anything they want to and to behave any way they want to and boast about themselves because they assume that they are a sign that allah loves them so the momin points out that this is a bubble and the bubble can burst any day a millionaire can become a beggar and a beggar can become a millionaire one day a sick person may become healthy and fit and a healthy person may get crippled in seconds verse 42 it so happened that all his fruit produce was destroyed and the vines tumbled down from their trestles so he wrung his hands with grief for all that he had spent on it he cried i wish i had not associated anyone with my rab Now what was the man's crime can anyone tell ingratitude instead of saying alhamdulillah he prided and praised himself so what happened allah allah's command came and his garden was destroyed he was wringing his hands in misery but nothing availed him saying i wish i had not associated anyone with allah he at once realizes where he went wrong this shows that in the hearts of hearts every sinner knows the injustice he's doing but arrogance stops him from admitting but when allah smashes the source of his arrogance only then he consciously realizes and also admits then Then he realized the wisdom of the believer's words that he had indeed done shirk. The verse says that its produce was struck by destruction from all sides. It obviously means that some major calamity hit his gardens, his uh, wealth and things of luxury, reducing everything to ruin. The Quran does not mention any particular calamity explicitly. Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas رضي الله تعالى عنه explains it as fire, which came from the skies and burnt the whole thing. And Allah knows best. Verse forty three. He was so helpless that he could neither find anyone to help him besides Allah, nor could he himself avert that avert that catastrophe. Now all his friends deserted him like you know rats deserting a sinking ship laugh and the world laughs with you weep and you weep alone just try it the number of friends we have when we are wealthy when we entertain them well they will all diminish they will all leave us only our true friends will remain if we lose our wealth god forbid everyone is going to you know Uh, turn aside and this teaches us something very important that our relationships should be based on allah the only relationship that will endure till the end of time and even beyond that it says in a hadith that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep those people on pulpits of light the people who loved each other for his sake and everyone else would be hating each other bitterly see the verse that we read earlier on the importance of good company that verse meant that if god forbid we have a friend whose heart is devoid of zikr of allah who is just following his or her nafs and her desires will be a cause of shame and regret on the day of judgment why because she influenced us wrong she led us to sin and disobeying allah 
and on the day of judgment we will have to pay for that mistake allah teaches us that on that day all best friends would be bitter enemies illa al muttaqin except those who were allah conscious so love each other for the sake of allah only then this love is going to endure verse 44 it was then that he realized that the real protection comes only from allah his is the best reward and his is the best requital now the word walaya means friendship walaya means help walaya means protection this is the bottom line la ilaha illallah there is no friend but allah there is no protector but allah and allah describes himself as being al-haq and in this surah which tells us about truth and lies it is important to realize that only allah is true and everything else is false only allah is haq and everything is batil he is the best to reward and he is the best in requiting This is such a profound verse Allah is the only being who can reward you Allah is the only being who can recompense just bring to your mind whatever you did for people and then what they did for you and what you did for Allah and what Allah did for you and then you are going to get this answer verse 45 o prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam give them the similitude of the life of this world it is like the vegetation of the earth that flourishes with the rain from the sky but afterwards the same vegetation turns into a dry stubble which is blown away by the winds allah is the one who has power over everything now after this story we learn the reality of the life of this world allah says that the life of this world is like water what is <clears throat> hayatud dunya it consists of several stages number 1 infancy a little baby playing with his rattle all his concern is getting milk and being changed going to sleep that's all the baby cannot see beyond that that's his immediate concern and that's what all his life revolves around number 2 the baby becomes a child and you see that the child uh, plays little games worried about winning worried, worried about losing going to school they have their little concerns which seem so tiny to us but they seem so immense when you are going through them yourself number 3 after childhood comes adolescence the age of zina when you are beautifying yourself when you want to look good your clothes are very important you must be perfect your shoes have to be right and you have to look good that's the major concern and some people <laughs> never outgrow this stage number 4 then comes the youth which is called the age of tafakhur which means mutual boasting where you want to show that i have more diamonds than you i have a better car than you my house is more beautiful than you my children are better than yours and this goes on and on and on boasting mutually then the fifth point then comes old age which is called the age of takasur where you are concerned with your bank balance your property this is al hayatud dunya the way most of us live it the stages through which we all pass allah says that hayatud dunya is like a short lived harvest it's like rain the earth responds and it becomes lush and fertile and we look at it and say subhanallah this is forever but what happens ultimately it becomes dry twigs that the wind scatter in other words life is like a short lived harvest it ripens it dries and it's gone for some it is cut in youth for some in old age for some in infancy but ultimately it's cut for all life is so fragile that it, it can be over in one minute death is nearer to us than our shoelaces as hazrat abu bakr siddiq razi allah taala anhu said the greatest truth is la ilaha illallah we belong to allah and to allah we have to return 
What keeps us from this? Why don't we realize it? Even if we realize it, what makes us forget this? Two things which can be a blessing and which can be a curse. They are mentioned in the next verse. Verse 46, likewise, wealth and children are an attraction of this worldly life. Yet honorable deeds that last forever are a better hope of salvation. So the two obstacles are number one, mal, wealth. Everyone wants it. No one has enough. Those who have it are worried about protecting it. The more you want it, those who don't have are obsessed with gaining it. And number two, Albanoon, children, especially for women. If you have daughters, you want sons. You have sons, you want daughters. When you have both, you are worried about them. Those who don't have them are longing desperately for them and are getting in depressions that why didn't I get them? Those who have them are obsessed by them. The, these are my child's school years. These are my child's adolescence. This is my child's first O-level exam. This is my child's first... A level exams. This is my child's first career. This is my child's marriage. And when they have children, you get involved with them. And this goes on and on. Now, both these things can become a stepping stone for us. But most of us make them into obstacles. Allah says, Your wealth is a blessing. You can use it for Allah. It can bring you closer to Allah. But what happens is that, for example, people say, I'm so busy in my job, I don't have time to pray. That means I have made my job job and obstacle that kept me away from Allah. My children can become stepping stones from, for me when I raise them as good Muslims, when I teach them about Islam so that they become a sadaqatun jariya for me when I die. But we make them into obstacles when we say that my child is crying too much, how can I pray? I have to take riba so that my child can have this raised standard of living. When I say to myself that I have to be in the in crowd, I have to dress up in a way so that my children aren't ashamed of me. Al-Malu wal Banoon. Zinatul Hayatu Dunya. They are a part of the bubble. They make the bubble look so beautiful. But remember, the bubble will blast one day and everything will perish. Everyone would die. Everything would become like a barren wasteland. So what then would be left? Now, what exactly is al baqiyatu salihat It has been stated in the Musnad of Ahmad that Hazrat Abu Sayyid al-Khudri anhu reported that Prophet wasallam said, accumulate al baqiyatu salihat as much as you can. It was said that what are they? He said, Subhanallah, la ilaha illallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, wala hawla wala quwata illa billah. The same has been reported in the Say of Muslim and the Ramzi on the authority of Hazrat Abu Huraira ta'ala anhu that the Prophet wasallam said, I like saying, Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wala ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Pure is Allah and all praise belongs to Allah and there is no God but Allah and Allah is great. He said, I like this kalima better than anything else under the sun. Hazrat Jabir Razi Allah said, recite, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. There is no power. There is no strength except with Allah. A lot because it removes 99 types of ailments out of which anxiety is the least painful. So take into consideration all these narrations. Hazrat Ibn Abbas Razi Allah um, anho, Ikrama, Mujahid have done tafsir of Baqiyatu Salihat, the very recitation of these words. So, one of the Baqiyatu Salihat is the tasbihat of these words. Then, other commentators, which include Sayyid uh, Ibn Jubair, uh, Masrook, Ibrahim, that the Baqiyatu Salihat are the five daily prayers. Now, there's another report from Hazrat Ibn Abbas, ta'ala anhu, which says that Al Baqiyatu Salihat in this verse means righteous deeds in a general sense. Included in it are the words mentioned above, the five prayers, and all other righteous deeds as well. This explanation is also supported by the commentator Qatada.
Ubaid ibn Umair radiyallahu ta'ala anhu said that baqiyat to salihat are righteous daughters for they are for their parents the greatest treasure and reward from Allah this is supported by a narration of Hazrat Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha according to which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been reported to have said i saw a man from my umma under orders to be taken to hell thereupon his righteous daughters clung to him and started wailing and crying and praying to allah oh allah spare him for he was very kind to us in the mortal world and he worked very hard to raise us in our family allah taala in his mercy forgave him and this also shows the power of dua of a daughter or daughter who has been well kept by the father and he did not restrain his hands from spending on her so baqiya to salihat would include in would include every good deed done for the pure intention for pleasing allah visiting someone sick for allah giving sadaqa for allah giving good advice to someone for allah in short it covers all hukukul ibad and hukuk allah it says in hadith qudsi the gist of which is that on the day of judgment allah will say i was sick and you did not visit me and the person would say that allah how could you be sick how could i visit you when uh, you are rabbul alamin and allah will say so and so slave of mine was sick but you never visited them and the hadith goes on to describe feeding the poor and feeding the needy and giving people to drink hukuk allah and hukukul ibad go south side by side al baqiya to saliha taking care of a sick child attending a sick parent giving money for a hospital or a madrasa planting a tree providing food providing water for animals all these come under it and especially the knowledge which you left behind for the sake of allah what is our folly that instead of making these two blessings mentioned in this verse wealth and children into baqiya to saliha we start relying on them thank god i have a son he will take care of me in my old age that's why we ask allah for sons what guarantee do we have that this son will live to see you in old age what guarantee do we have that he will take care of us and be there when we need him we hope and we pray but no one knows allah says that focus on making these two blessings sadaqatun jariya for you and become your baqiya to salihat and don't be deluded by wealth and children don't get so blind in their love that you are ready to anger allah use them as stepping stones use them as tools to gain akhirah wa akhiru dawana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alamin